Hello everyone, reporting today for First Updates Now, I'm Abhas, and with me here is Team 16379, the Kooky Bots from Sammamish, Washington. In power play, they had an absolutely fantastic season. They were the Franklin Innovate Award recipients, division finalists, had a very deep run at the Maryland Tech Invitational, and were the first team with the 1 plus 10 autonomous. This season, they're coming back with a bang, and after their first competition, they put up just some really, really high scores and have an incredible robot. We're gonna go through this super, super fast robot, how they made all these mechanisms work as efficiently as they are, all of that and more coming up on First Updates Now. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. The new Robit system by Anymark can reduce complexity and enable robust builds. Parts align to a common one half inch grid, simplifying construction and allowing alignment of both structure and motion components. Robits enables teams to always have the parts they need to complete a build. Head on over to Anymark.com slash Robits to learn more in order today. Fun is continuing to grow and looking for new ad partners for the 2024 season. If your organization has a positive message to spread to our over 250,000 unique viewers, go to firstupdatesnow.com slash contact to get more information. Okay guys, let's get started first with just your overall design process and approach to the game. You know, every game is very different. So how did you approach the uh, center stage game and what went into it? Sure, so I think the first thing that we noticed immediately on kickoff was that there was three stacks of five pixels each that you can score during autonomous. And the first thing um, that we thought of was, wow, that's actually going to be pretty difficult because at a bare minimum, that's seven and a half cycles all the way across the field and all the way back. And on top of that, uh, grabbing the pixels off of the stack seemed like it would be a much harder challenge than grabbing elements during autonomous periods um, from seasons in the past. And so that drove two main design decisions. The first one is, uh, which we'll talk about later, how we ended up with a claw. And the second one is we wanted to minimize how much our drivetrain had to travel during those cycles, which is how we ended up with our um, basically overall robot architecture. Yeah. And so now going into just the drivetrain, right? Everyone, obviously the biggest question on people's mind with your drivetrain is why run a Mechanum after spending so much time developing a swerve drive last season and, you know, winning the Innovate Award at the World Championship. So let's talk about that. Yeah, so despite the success we had with the swerve drivetrain uh, last year, working on it for almost an entire season um, taught us a couple of things. And the first one was, um, and it's pretty obvious, but early season time is extremely valuable. Um, and one thing that came back to bite us last season was we didn't perform so well in the early season. And we were able to iron most of that out um, by the time we got near the end, but that's not a mistake that we wanted to repeat this year. Um, on top of that, Mason is a senior this year, and so he had college applications. We had a lot of software things um, that we wanted to work on, and we didn't want to limit ourselves by committing to a swerve drive at such an early stage. Yeah, and so now Mason, just talking about this Mechanum drivetrain, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of things that you guys do that, uh, you know, more rookie teams or early teams can learn from. So why don't you give us a quick overview of the software behind the drivetrain, anything you think that's really important from both autonomous and teleop perspective? Yeah, so um, I've got a lot of questions recently about how our uh, movements in autonomous are so smooth, what pathing system we're using, and it's very simple. It's literally just a PID controller on the robot position. Um, in the future, though, we do plan to use a more robust pathing system, actually defining every point where the robot will be rather than just a point-to-point -point system. Uh, and then we just use pretty simple kinematics on top of that. Uh, we don't use field-centric, uh, but we do use robot-centric just because we find it to be a little bit easier to control the robot uh, for the season's game. Yeah. And, you know, I think a thing I love asking teams on behind the bots and just like throughout the season is, can we see the bottom of your robot to see what the drivetrain looks like? I know it's a little different from you for you guys, but still very interested in, uh, in seeing that. Yeah. So what's the what's the decision behind the belly pan? I feel like that's much more of like an FRC esque decision. Um, but, you know, if you could explain that quickly. Yeah. So it's something we started doing last year um, and it's a two millimeter carbon fiber belly pan. And it serves like two main purposes. The first one is it um, protects the entire uh, entirety of the bottom of our robot, our wiring, our mechanisms. Um, it stops game elements from getting um, caught inside of our drive crane uh, since they can't go from the sides. And it also doubles as part of our superstructure. It holds the, our drive crane sides to a crossbar that runs down the middle of the robot and in general just makes things a lot more rigid. Got it. And so you guys are running three-wheel odometry then uh, for the... 
Yeah, so we've got the standard four mechanical wheels, and then we've got our three wheels, a dollar tree that is sprung and sticking out of holes in our belly band. All right, yeah, so, you know, enough about the drivetrain. Let's uh, get into the arm. We'll first start, uh, why don't we just start with an overview of the entire scoring and intaking mechanism, and then we can go into specific components after that. Sure, let's just do a demonstration real quick of how it looks like from intaking um, all the way to depositing on the backdrop. Um, so when we've got two pixels, we'll have our human player place them side by side in the wing, and then we'll go out to intake. And as you can see, everything extends, our claw comes down, um, and then we'll retract and grab those, and then we'll drive to our depositing position where we'll have a one button extension sequence. And as soon as we're lined up with the backdrop with this at a 60 degree angle, so it's parallel, we'll hit the drop button. Oh, bad. Uh, and then we have another one button retraction sequence to reset um, and then get ready to intake another pixel. Um, and looking at this robot might remind you of an FRC robot that we have really taken inspiration from this season, and that's Team 2910 Jack in the Bot. Um, and the reason we decided to go with an architecture like this is, like I mentioned earlier, we were trying to minimize how much we had to drive. And this design gives us extension out the front of our robot and extension out the back of our robot without needing two sets of sliders. And so that reduces a lot of the complexity that's normally associated with a design like this. Yeah, and so now... Uh, we'll break down like each aspect of it uh, rather than starting like at the base or starting at the uh, front of it I actually want to start with the telescoping system um, so can we start just by you know you mentioned Jack in the Bot 2910 FRC as the design can we compare your guys's designs a little bit like what is their max box tube size what is your max box tube size and what other differences exist between each design sure so I think one of the unique things about this robot as you've mentioned is the um, box tube elevator and we looked at Jack in the Box which um, off the top of my head I don't know the exact numbers but it's around three times the thickness and three times the width of ours. We use one and a half inch by one and a half inch extrusion on our base stage that goes up to a one inch by one inch and finally a half inch by half inch all the way at the top. Um, and so that's just supported by bearings on the top of each stage. Uh, there are bearings at the bottom of each stage that you cannot be that can't be seen here. Um, and then our cascade stringing um, and continuous retraction. And I think the main thing that this has allowed us to do is it's allowed us to have an extremely stable center of gravity because one challenging part about this design is ensuring that with such a long extension, um, creating a really large moment of inertia when it's swinging over, you don't want your front wheels to be leaving the ground. And um, by using this box tube system, we're able to cut down the weight of our end effector by more or less half compared to aluminum drawer slides. And that's what allows us to extend without having any problems with tipping. Sure. And, you know, I know it's relatively early in the season still. Uh, not relatively, just very early in the season still. But, you know, you're always thinking about how to get better, how to get just a little bit faster. You, could you give us some insight into, like, if you were to do it again, what are some very few changes you would make to it? Sure. So obviously one of the biggest um, design constraints is how much time you have to pull something off. Um, and as an early V1 prototype, this works really well. But if I was to do it again, I would definitely want to pocket at the bare minimum the outside tube and ideally the inside tubes as well. Um, and this would do two main things. One, it would cut down on that weight like we were talking about earlier, but the second thing it would allow us to do is it would allow us to service the components inside of the lift a lot easier than we can right now. Um, and so at the moment, we've got a few, um, if you can grab the second camera, we have an access hole in our middle stage and we have access to the bottom stage from the bottom of the lift. However, it's suboptimal to have to either retract it all the way or extend it all the way in order to service these components. Um, and so pocketing it would serve uh, those two purposes pretty well. Mm -hmm. And so now I want to talk a little bit about the software side with your arm. You know, I understand it's just me one that happened. There's a lot more software changes that you want to make. But for now, how is your arm controlled? Uh, you know, what, what algorithms do you have going on behind it? And what would you recommend for teams to look into implementing? Yeah, so there's two main systems we use. We use uh, PID as well as motion profiling. 
So the PID controller just lets us get to the position in the first place, but the motion profiling is where the magic happens. That's what, that's what allows us to smooth out our movements uh, and really uh, uh, reduces the number of jerky movements going on in the robot. Um, because a lot of the system is moving really fast all the time. There's a lot of inertia where we're going from fully extended movements to scoring. Uh, motion profiling really lets us smooth that out and reduce all of that inertia overall. Got it. And so is this motion profiling system that you're describing, is this something you developed last season or two seasons ago, or it's something entirely new that you've been working on for this season? You know, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so last season we had a virtual four bar on our bot, and we wanted a a uh, system that could reliably reduce the amount of oscillation while keeping uh, high acceleration when we're trying to move to a target position uh, with the servos. So we opted to create a system, uh, asymmetrical motion profiling. And this system basically allowed us to have different acceleration and deceleration times, where we can accelerate really quickly using the physical constraints of the robot and then decelerate to make sure we do reduce oscillation and general wear and tear of the system. Mm -hmm. um, and we're using the same system here uh, we're not currently using it on any servos, just because it's not really needed. Um, but it's on both the uh, rotation motor as well as the extension motor. Got it. Yeah, I think that's been a great overview of your extension. So before we talk about your claw, let's uh, talk about your arm pitch a little bit. I think it gets overshadowed a little bit because it's just, you know, tucked very inside the robot. It's not discussed a lot. So Veer, why don't you start by just giving us an overview of your arm pitch system, uh, and then we'll go into into the claw after. Yeah, so one of the biggest challenges with designing a system like this is, um, I believe he's talking about the arm pitch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the largest uh, problems with a system like this is you need to minimize the amount of backlash. Um, and the reason for that is a small amount of error at the base over here translates to an extremely large error when it's fully extended. And when you're trying to pick up half-inch tall pixels, uh, that error can add up really quickly. And the main thing we've done to combat this is the shaft that our entire arm um, pivot is running on is directly mounted into an absolute encoder. Um, and it's actually just an axon encoder that we have sitting, tucked in right over there behind it. Um, and essentially what that means is there is no backlash in between the measured position and the actual position. Um, as for the actual power transmission, we are running a 26.9 to 1 motor tucked um, in underneath our battery over here, and that's just uh, chained at a 4 to 1 reduction to this Gobilda sprocket that drives the entire system. Got it, yeah, and so, you know, just from some napkin math, we're looking at like around 60 RPM, um, no load speed? Yep. Okay, got it. Okay, so now... The claw, right? This has been another super controversial decision, I'd say, with this robot uh, from like the community. You know, everyone's like, oh, active intake, active intake, active intake. But currently, you guys are sitting at the fourth highest teleop OPR. This is about a week after your competition, so there has been some other matches. I think right before your comp or right after your competition, you were second, and that was a couple disconnects. So obviously, your teleop is going very well, right? So walk me through first the decision to use a claw, and then we'll jump in later into how exactly it it works and what's going on. Sure, so the decision can pretty much be explained in one word, and that's precision. As I talked about earlier, uh, we really looked at those auto stacks and we thought this is going to be difficult, this is going to be a difficult challenge to cycle quickly and effectively, and intaking is going to be a large part of it. Having a claw allows us to control exactly where a pixel is uh, being intake instead of basically um, driving forward into them with an active intake um, and hoping that it goes in. And so if you look at our claw, uh, we have a uh, we have two claws side by side, um, and that allows us to deposit side by side as well as intake side by side. But the special thing is, um, and this is what's going to help us in autonomous, is our claw is tall enough to pick up two pixels at a time, and then it can deposit two pixels at one time as well when it flips over. Um, and that's going to allow us the flexibility we need to be able to intake well from the wing, as well as intake well from the stacks. Uh, so looking at how this claw was built, we have the Axon Micros, and the reason for that is, well, <laughs> it's pretty simple. Imagine trying to fit a standard size servo, and then trying to fit four of them. Obviously, that weight, that um, compactness, would severely hinder how fast we're able to uh, drive this mechanism. So we've got the micros, those are just on in independently um, actuating fingers. 
Um, and then we have the two um, axon micros as well back here in order to be able to pivot this to go between the storm position, the intaking position, and the deposit position. Sure. And so a couple questions about your claw now is going forward, uh, are there any changes you'd like to make to it? Any, any problems you'd like to address? Uh, yeah, let's, let's start with that. Sure. So with the current design, um, uh, we are pretty happy with how it's been performing. There's a few upgrades that are already planned, already in the works. The first one is we're going to add sensors to our claw so that uh, we can transition from manual controls to automating some of the more um, precise tasks. Um, there's these two uh, sensor mounts right here that do not currently have any sensors, but we're planning on adding uh, LiDAR-based uh, digital distance sensors that will essentially read low when there's no pixel, and then immediately when there is a pixel, they'll be covered and they'll trigger to a high state. Um, and so that allows to sensorize that. Um, beyond a few uh, minor, maybe geometry tweaks, uh, one thing we have explored is adding an active intake similar to the cheesy proofs um, charged up intake, which would not be on the extension, but rather if we find the need, it'll be attached to the main robot and it'll be able to deploy in front in order to essentially facilitate um, moving pixels that might not be where they where we want them to be on the field, uh, but still be able to retain the precision of the claws that we have right now. Got it. Yeah, I think that's uh really sums up the entire claw subsystem well. So you know, looking forward to the rest of the season, we've talked about this robot and all of the various aspects of it. Looking forward to future league meets. What are some things you're looking to improve? You know, you don't have to reveal the whole uh, game plan right now, right? The whole playbook, but giving a little teaser to the audience before we end things off would really go a long way. I mean, the main thing is autonomous. Uh, we went to league meet one with a simple double preload plus spark autonomous, and we're hoping to start adding cycles to that as the season progresses. Uh, beyond that, our end game currently, uh, we were focusing on simplic simplicity of our robot for the early season, but as the season progresses, we do plan to add uh, the climb and drone launching mechanisms uh, to rack up those points in the end game period. Yeah, and from a software perspective, Mason, what are we looking at? Yeah, so from the software perspective, there's, we noticed a lot of inconsistency when scoring and telling out. Um, and while this can definitely be ironed out with driver practice, there's a lot of assistance we can do to help uh, reduce the amount of error that we have in scoring so we don't always have to uh, as as precisely align as we uh, would have been. Um, so we're planning on adding distance sensors at the back of the bot, uh, as well as using inverse kinematics to then calculate how far the arm and extension needs to go out uh, in order to score from any given position. Um, something that uh, we're already using on the bot that I uh, forgot to mention was whenever we're scoring right now, we found that the claw works best when it's parallel to the backdrop. So at any given arm, uh, arm angle, uh, we can pivot this to make sure that we're scoring. We're basically going to try and automate this entire uh, scoring uh, kind of sequence. Yeah. All right. Veer, Mason, Dia, you know, thank you so much for this interview. I think it's really going to teach the community a lot. There's so much to learn from this bot and how you guys just approach, play the game just overall, uh, you know, to FTC. So reporting for first updates now, I'm Abbas, and with me is Team 16379, the Kooky Bots. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. The new Robit system by Anymark can reduce complexity and enable robust builds. Parts align to a common one half inch grid, simplifying construction and allowing alignment of both structure and motion components. Robits enables teams to always have the parts they need to complete a build. Head on over to Anymark.com slash Robits to learn more in order today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.